Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen. 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 Katie. Katie. What? Hi. (laughs) Really? You love me. Yeah. Let's just keep rolling, though. Right into our rolling rehash. Last time, we discussed Chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback, and its corresponding film scenes. The movie puts schoolwork on the back burner since Hagrid can't fit in the library, the book made a mortal enemy of PETA, and we took a trip to the Department of Redundancy Department. Hagrid became a mummy, but discovers those who live in wood houses shouldn't own dragons. After a few too many brush fires, the little guy gets sent off to be raised by Charlie Weasley, and Harry and Hermione win first place in the dumbass Olympics by leaving the invisibility cloak on the astronomy tower. Not that it happens quite that way in the movie, of course. During episode 14, Fungal Hagrid, our Potter pondering was, is it weird that Hagrid was serving stoat sandwiches? I still say no. It's highly unlikely I'll ever eat one myself, but it doesn't bother me that Hagrid does. It's because you're a Slytherin. Justin specifically said, don't eat my Patronus. (laughs) And now that Quincy knows what a stoat is, he wants to know what's wrong with Hagrid. I mean, Hagrid is half giant, so maybe his giant blood has something to do with it. That actually makes a lot of sense to me. Hagrid is just so lovable that I sometimes forget his giant blood could still actually affect him in subtle ways. Because other than being too big to be allowed, he really (laughs) doesn't show any tendencies that implicate him as a giant or a Mm half-giant. So maybe he just has a really subtle one where he likes to catch and eat his own critters. That could be. That could be, though it isn't really that different from hunters that catch and eat their own food either, though. And Diana did point out that because they are carnivorous animals, they would not be very tasty. But then she also seems to be more in line with your sentiment. They're Mm -hmm. cute, but so are cows and pigs and lambs and bunnies. Oh my. And and she still enjoys eating those. See, I'm just saying. But she also shared that another name for a stoat is an ermine, which were commonly hunted and raised for their fur. It seems very haggard that the whole animal is being used respecting the animal by not wasting it. And he does wear like, he wears a fur furs. Coat, so yeah, he maybe wears that was ermine and, and that's And is it looked like it looks kind of like in his hat that there's like furs on the chairs and stuff. Yeah, maybe that's so, all ermine. Who knows? Some ferrets, some ermine, some bear. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> Carly's input was kind of along those same lines. She figured that Hagrid probably caught them in his garden and decided to use them. It seems he really likes to cook, even if he isn't good at it, so maybe that's just a new recipe he's trying. That could also be possible. Stoat sandwiches probably aren't the worst thing he ever tried serving people. Though, I still think they might be the cutest. Poor little stoaties. <laughs> yeah, let's just, let's just keep rolling. Our trivia question was, who are the three centaurs that we see in the Forbidden Forest? If you said Bane, Ronan, and Ferenz then you know your centaurs and Harry Potter trivia. Once again, congratulations goes to Quincy. Woohoo! This is week six of his streak, though Carly would like to point out that she did beat him to answering the extra trivia question from our bonus Potterheads of History episode. But since those episodes are monthly and separate from our weekly ones, we decided that it doesn't count to interrupt his streak. Though it was really satisfying to see a Hufflepuff beat a Gryffindor. I'm sure it was Slytherin. (laughs) You're just biased, Gryffindor. Maybe a little. (laughs) Though, honestly, Quincy, we love you, and you know your trivia, but the competition is getting intense, and the excitement of someone actually being able to interrupt your streak literally has me waking up in the middle of the night on a school night to check to see who answered the question (laughs) first. I mean, I'm usually awake already because I don't sleep. I'm kind of a vampire. But the sentiment is the same. (laughs) So we want to clue our other keepers into something that could help them. If you follow us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com, then you can get the episode as early as possible. Yeah, we upload the podcast to Podbean and then they send it out to Apple and Spotify and Google and whatnot. 
Plus, I schedule it to go up at midnight on Thursdays turning to Fridays, and it keeps posting earlier than that. So keep an eye out. Yeah, I have this mental image of Quincy just refreshing the Podbean app until the episodes show up, then pushing play and immediately jumping to the end to hear the trivia question and code word. Oh, yeah, definitely. So with this information, maybe one of these days someone is going to beat him to the answer of the weekly trivia question, or maybe it will just be hard enough of a question that he doesn't know the answer. (laughs) Although that does seem a little unlikely. Perhaps, but people are trying. True. Dave is super determined to beat him, and even went as far as to create his own trivia post on our Facebook page, which he then answered it as well. I'm not sure it actually counts as beating him, since I don't even think Quincy knew about the post, but I appreciate the effort. Yeah, Dave, for a Hufflepuff, that was very Slytherin of you. Hey! The hell is that supposed to mean? I'm just saying, it was sneaky, like a snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep rolling into chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest, and its corresponding film scenes. Chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest. Filch takes Harry and Hermione down to Professor McGonagall's study on the first floor. They sit quietly waiting, Hermione trembling and Harry desperately trying to come up with an excuse. It seems unlikely and he can't believe that they were stupid enough to forget the cloak. Harry doesn't think that things could be any worse until Professor McGonagall walks in with Neville, who immediately tries to tell Harry that he was trying to find them and warn them that he overheard Malfoy saying he was going to try and catch them with the dragon. Harry shakes his head, cutting him off, and McGonagall sees and angrily begins to lecture them. She asks for an explanation, but no one says anything, so McGonagall says that it sounds like Harry fed Draco a story about a dragon to try and get him in trouble, but that Longbottom heard it too and also fell for it. Neville is really hurt to think that it was all a trick, and McGonagall is so angry that four students were out of bed that she takes 50 points each from Gryffindor and assigns them all detention. Gryffindor is now in last place for the House Cup, and they are all dreading the rest of Gryffindor finding out what happened. The next morning, when the Gryffindors notice they are down 150 points, they first think it is a mistake. Eventually, the story gets around, and everyone knows that Harry Potter and a couple of stupid first years lost them all those points. Even the Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws are mad at them, because now no one has a chance of finally beating the Slytherins. Harry tries to resign from the Quidditch team to make up for it, but Wood says they won't be able to earn any points back without him as Seeker. The rest of the team is still really upset with him and will only refer to him as the Seeker. Harry promises himself that he will never meddle in things again and finds himself almost glad that exams are coming up because studying has become a good distraction. About a week before exams, Harry's promise not to meddle is tested when he leaves the library one afternoon and hears Quirrell crying and protesting in a classroom. It sounds like someone is threatening him and Harry rushes back to Ron and Hermione and they all think that Snape must be getting closer to getting at the stone. Hermione thinks that they should go to Dumbledore with this information, but Harry thinks they should just stay out of it because they have no proof and they aren't even supposed to know about the stone. The next morning, Harry, Hermione, and Neville receive notes detailing their detentions. They are supposed to meet Filch in the entrance hall at 11 p.m. Harry forgot that they also have to serve detentions and expects Hermione to complain about losing a night of studying, but she seems to think they deserve what they got. That night, they said goodnight to Ron in the common room, and Harry, Hermione, and Neville go down to the entrance hall. Filch is waiting for them, with Malfoy, and he takes them all outside, leading them to Hagrid's hut and lecturing them along the way. Harry is initially relieved that they are going to be with Hagrid, until he finds out they are going into the Forbidden Forest. Even Malfoy is afraid to go into the forest. Hagrid walks up to meet them, and Filch says he will pick them up at dawn and heads back to the castle. Malfoy turns to Hagrid and tells him that he will not go into the forest. Hagrid responds that he'll do something useful or get out. Malfoy stops arguing and Hagrid gives instructions, pointing out silvery unicorn blood and explaining that something in the forest has been hurting unicorns. He says that one was found dead and they need to find the hurt one. Malfoy wants to know what happens if whatever hurt the unicorn finds them first. Hagrid reassures him that nothing in the forest will hurt them if they are with him or Fang. He tells them to keep to the path and splits them into two groups, 
Malfoy and Neville with Fang, and Harry and Hermione with him. They are to send up green sparks if they find the unicorn and red sparks if they get into trouble. They walk into the forest and go separate ways at the fork. Harry asks Hagrid if a werewolf could be killing the unicorns, but Hagrid tells him that they aren't fast enough. They continue following the unicorn blood until Hagrid hears something, tells them to get behind a tree, and arms his crossbow. The three of them listen and can hear a slithering sound like a cloak over dead leaves, but they can't see anything. The sound fades away and they continue walking until they come across a centaur named Ronan. Hagrid tells Ronan about the unicorn and asks if he has seen anything strange. Ronan responds saying that Mars is unusually bright tonight. Another centaur, Bane, shows up and echoes Ronan's comment about Mars being unusually bright tonight. Hagrid is frustrated that they aren't any help and they move on. He says that they know things but don't let on much. Harry wonders if it was a centaur they heard earlier and is very uneasy walking through the forest. Hermione then notices red sparks and worries that the other two are in trouble. Hagrid tells them to wait there and runs towards the red sparks. He finds the two boys and realizes that Malfoy played a trick on Neville, causing him to panic and send up the sparks. To avoid more issues like that, he switches Neville and Harry and the two groups continue looking for the unicorn. After about a half hour, Harry, Malfoy, and Fang come across the unicorn, which is dead. Harry starts to walk closer to the sad scene when a hooded figure comes crawling across the ground toward the unicorn. Malfoy screams and runs off, with Fang right behind him. The hooded figure looks up at Harry, and there is unicorn blood dripping all down the front of its cloak. As it stands and approaches Harry, he feels a sharp pain in his scar and falls backwards. Hoofs come from behind him, and a third centaur chases the hooded figure away. The centaur helps Harry to his feet and recognizes him. He introduces himself as Ferenz and offers him a ride back to Hagrid, as it isn't safe for Harry in the forest. Harry climbs onto his back, but before they go anywhere, Ronan and Bane show up and berate Ferenz for allowing a human on his back, like a common mule. Ferenz argues that he thinks it is more important to help the Potter boy and set himself against what lurks in the forest, and takes off to find Hagrid. As they ride through the trees, Ferenz tells Harry that killing a unicorn is one of the worst things you can do, and that drinking its blood will keep you alive, but in a half-life or a cursed life. Harry wonders why anyone would choose to do that, and Ferenz tells him that it could be used to keep a person alive, until they find something else to return them to full power he helps Harry realize that Voldemort must be after the stone. They find Hagrid, and Harry tells him about the unicorn. Ferenz says goodbye. Back in the common room, Ron had fallen asleep waiting for them. Harry wakes him up and tells him and Hermione what he learned from Ferenz. He thinks that Snape must want the stone for Voldemort, and that Ferenz saved him but shouldn't have, because Bane was angry that he interfered. Harry figures that it is written in the stars that Voldemort will kill him and that it's only a matter of time before Voldemort gets his hands on the stone and comes back to finish the job. Hermione reassures him that Dumbledore is the only one that you know who is afraid of and that the centaur's knowledge sounds like fortune-telling, which Professor McGonagall says is a very imprecise branch of magic. They continue talking for the rest of the night but eventually head to bed. When Harry pulls back his covers, he finds the invisibility cloak folded neatly beneath them, with a note saying, just in case. In the movie, the scene starts out in an empty classroom where McGonagall is lecturing the trio and Malfoy for being out of bed at night. To their dismay, she punishes them by taking 50 points each and assigns them all detention. Initially, Malfoy is gloating about the trio's punishment, but then he realizes that McGonagall is including him in it as well. This fact seems to make the trio feel a little bit better about the situation. We then see Filch leading Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Malfoy out of the castle, lamenting about a time that detention meant hanging by your thumbs in the dungeons. He misses the screaming. As they walk up to Hagrid's hut, Filch explains that they will be serving their detention with Hagrid in the dark forest. Hagrid is rather sniffly, and Filch berates him for still being upset over the dragon. Dumbledore sent him off to Romania to be with his own kind, and Hagrid is worried that he won't like Romania or the other dragons. At this point, Malfoy realizes that they really are going into the forest and starts to protest, afraid of running into werewolves. But Hagrid takes them into the forest anyway. 
They walk a ways in, and then Hagrid pauses to check a silvery substance on the ground. Harry asks him what it is, and he explains that it is unicorn blood, that he found one dead a few weeks ago, and this one has been hurt badly by something. Harry sees a cloaked, shadowy figure off in the distance, and then Hagrid says that they need to go find the unicorn and splits them up to do it. He takes Ron and Hermione and sends Harry with Malfoy, who demands to have Fang too. Hagrid agrees, but warns him that Fang is a coward. As Fang and the two boys head off, Malfoy complains about having to do servant's work, saying that his father will hear about this. Harry accuses him of being scared, and Malfoy denies it. They follow the path and find the cloaked figure over a dead unicorn, drinking its blood. Draco and Fang run off, screaming and barking, and Harry remains behind as the cloaked figure glides towards him. As it nears, a centaur gallops in and chases the figure off. The centaur warns Harry that the forest isn't safe for him at this time, and he tells him he must leave. Harry asks him what that thing was, and the centaur explains that it was a monstrous creature, willing to slay a unicorn. Drinking unicorn blood will keep someone alive even if they are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. Destroying something so pure will curse someone with a half-life. Harry wants to know who would choose that life, and the centaur asks if he can think of no one. Harry realizes that it must have been Voldemort, and the centaur asks him if he knows what is hidden in Hogwarts. As Harry makes the connection to the Sorcerer's Stone, Hagrid and the others show up. Hagrid greets the centaur as Ferenz, and asks Harry if he is alright. Ferenz tells Harry good luck and heads off. The scene ends on the dead unicorn before cutting to the trio in the Gryffindor common room. Harry is telling Ron and Hermione that they had it wrong, that Snape wants the Sorcerer's Stone for Voldemort. With it, Voldemort will be able to come back and try to kill Harry again. Ron looks really scared, but Hermione reassures them that Dumbledore is the only wizard that Voldemort fears, and as long as Dumbledore is around, Harry is safe. Nicely done. This might have been one of the longest summaries you've had to read yet. Facts. After your mere sentences the past couple weeks, I wasn't sure if you were going to make it. <laughs> yeah, I was. I kind of missed my nap this week. But anyways... Just like last week, we are seeing the continuation of some fairly big changes from the book to the movie. Yeah, last week we talked about how in the book, Ron had to go to the hospital wing after Norbert bit him. So he was not part of the dragon-sneaking, cloak-forgetting, points-losing, detention-earning shenanigans. Well done. Thank you. (laughs) I practiced. (laughs) After Tweedle Harry and Tweedle Hermione leave the cloak on the tower and get (laughs) caught by Filch, he takes them to McGonagall's study... And they wait for her there. She walks in with Neville, who also got caught out of bed. And those are the three that are being punished. Not the golden trio, like in the movie. And this is basically where the chapter and film scenes start out this week. McGonagall has shown up to chew bubblegum and punish students out of bed. And she's all out of bubblegum. I am now (laughs) trying to imagine McGonagall (laughs) chewing bubblegum. Yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, I, I think that's up there with... Letting her hair down. (gasps) Scandalous. Oh my. (laughs) Can you see her as like a biker chick back in the day? Just letting her hair, letting her hair fly, chewing some bubble gum. Not even a little bit. I can't. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure there's fan fiction about it somewhere. There must be. If not, someone get on that. Yeah. Please write us a biker chick McGonagall fanfic and we will (laughs) love you forever. (laughs) But yeah, the basic situation is the same between the two, even if the lead up to it is eh, somewhat modified. If by modified, you mean completely different, then yeah. Yeah. But you are right. (laughs) The outcome is very similar, except that the movie switched out Neville for Ron. And we have talked about this before. The movie likes to make pivotal scenes like that more about the trio rather than including supporting characters. Like last week, we saw that Nazi von Duschbeck II, a.k.a. bitch-ass snitch, went straight to McGonagall. Yeah, as we mentioned last week, there was a little bit of an overlap between the movie scenes that relate to chapters 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. Last week, we talked about how in chapter 14 of the book, Harry and Hermione are taking Norbert up to the tower, and that's when they see Professor McGonagall has caught Malfoy out of bed. She gives him a detention and takes 20 points from Slytherin. Right, but we didn't see it happen that way in the movie. Malfoy's punishment was lumped in with the trio, so instead of only losing 20 points, he lost 50. 
And the smug little bitch hadn't even realized it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love it. He didn't even realize it and, and that he was also being punished until McGonagall said, the four of you will be getting detention. And she's like, I'm sorry, I thought you said the four the of us. The four of us. And McGonagall must have been in a bad mood right? to take 50 points from each of them for being out of bed. That's a lot of points. Well, I mean, they did wake her up in the middle of the night. Like, like she's in her bed clothes. That's she, true. You know, she's wearing like her bonnet and stuff. <laughs> I'd be pissed too. But, but still. But still, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Like 50 points was pretty severe. Like she only took five from Hermione for going after a fucking mountain troll. But maybe it is the being out of bed thing because at least Hermione did that before bedtime. Because true. apparently that is the big crime here. Don't <laughs> wake McGonagall up. Don't be bed. Don't be out of bed. Don't after be bed. <laughs> Don't be bed. <laughs> don't be bad or bad. <laughs> yeah. Don't wake McGonagall up. Don't be out of bed after hours. But let's just keep rolling. In the book, after they lose all of those points, Hermione, Neville, and especially Harry are having a really hard time because everyone, even the Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws, are mad at them for it. Mm. Harry finds himself glad, <laughs> glad <laughs> to have upcoming exams. So he can distract himself from his misery by studying. Studying is a distraction from misery. It's that bad. That's how bad. That's pretty bad. He also promises himself that he isn't going to meddle in things anymore. Yeah, we'll see how we'll see how long that lasts. Right? Because if Harry isn't doing something incredibly brave and incredibly stupid, is he even Harry? Nope. <laughs> Especially since the first moment he comes across something he can meddle in, that's basically exactly what he does. He overhears Quirrell crying and being threatened in a classroom and has to stop in and listen. Sure, not meddling at all. Then, while not meddling, he immediately mm. runs back to Ron and Hermione to report to them what he overheard, theorizing that Snape must be getting closer to getting the stone. Hermione wants to tell Dumbledore and Ron wants to do some more poking around, but Harry says that he thinks they should stay out of it. Which, I mean, that's sort of not meddling, sort of. But none of that was included in the movie. The scene cut straight from Professor McGonagall's severe student smackdown <laughs> to the Golden Trio and Malfoy heading out to detention with Hagrid in the Forbidden Forest. Severe student smackdown. smackdown. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> Love it. Come see Minerva McGonagall in the severe student smackdown of the century. Ooh, that's some Ooh. good alliteration right there. Thanks. I have moments. But let's just keep rolling. <laughs> the book also includes Harry, Hermione, and Neville receiving letters during breakfast, saying that they will meet Mr. Filch in the entrance hall at 11 p.m., which makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> the punishment for being out of bed after hours is to have to be out of bed after hours? Yeah, that'll teach him a lesson. Not only that, but they're serving said punishment in the forbidden forest which is supposed to be i don't know forbidden except apparently for detention the i know i mean in the book funkel hagrid does explain that for detentions they will do something useful but i still don't see how that justifies having hagrid take 11 year olds into the forbidden forest at night and then motherfucker splits them up not to like, mention <laughs> splits them up not to mention the fact that sending Harry, a Gryffindor with a hero complex, into the Forbidden Forest is like punishing a Hufflepuff with chocolate cake. <laughs> or a Ravenclaw with a pop quiz. Or a Slytherin with a... Hey, wait, 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 wait. Hey, Ellen. How, how does that sentence end? You want to... Um, let me know. Really. Yeah. I'm just going to go back to talking about the chapter and movie scenes. So mm -hmm. yeah. Detention in the Forbidden Forest time. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Aside from switching Ron with Neville, the gist of this stayed the same. Uh-huh. Yeah. The only other big difference was that since we didn't have Harry and Hermione send the dragon off with Charlie's friends, there is a little section where Filch gives Hagrid a hard time about still being sad of, over the dragon. And Hagrid explains that Norbert is gone and that Dumbledore sent him off to Romania to be with other dragons. Right. And we talked about that some last week. 
Dumbledore would totally have helped out Hagrid, and mm-hmm. it is very unlikely that he would have gotten in any trouble for it. Yeah, like I said, I actually I actually kind of like the movie's take better. I think it makes way more sense than leaving it up to the 11-year-olds to solve. And since the trio are total meddlers... There's what? A, what? <laughs> Crazy. There is any number of ways that they could have been caught out of bed to receive their detentions, mm-hmm. which gets us back on track of the Forbidden Forest detention. Yep. In both the book and the movie, they need to go into the forest to find a unicorn that has been badly hurt. And Nazi Von Douchebag II is a total whiny bitch about doing so. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Extremely. He definitely got a new nickname this episode. Yeah. Bitch-ass snitch. Yep. I think that we may have mentioned this before, too, but Bitch-ass snitch says (laughs) that he heard there are werewolves in the forest. And that... (laughs) Like, that would just mean there are random people living in the forest, right? except for a few days each month when they were werewolves. Yeah, that cracks me up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think that is just one of those things that they let the students believe to deter them from going into the forest. Which makes sense, like the Shrieking Shack being haunted. Mm-hmm. Though, honestly, instead of telling tales of werewolves, they could just mention the actual acromantulas living in the forest. Oh, yeah. Dude. No, knowing there are giant-ass spiders in the forest might actually keep me from Hogwarts entirely. Seriously? Nah. But it would keep me the hell out the forest. Yet, for some reason, it appears they went with the werewolf myth. In the book, Harry even asks Hagrid multiple times if werewolves are involved. Hagrid tells him that werewolves aren't fast enough to catch a unicorn. But other than that... Doesn't say anything to point out that werewolves don't actually live in the forest. So yeah, I'd go with they're encouraging that rumor. Mm -hmm. That conversation wasn't in the movie because when they split up, Hagrid takes Ron and Hermione and Harry and Malfoy go with Fang. Yeah, that was bound to be a bit different than the book since they did a bit of a character switch. Mm -hmm. Since it was Neville, not Ron in the books, Hagrid initially sent Neville with Malfoy and kept Hermione and Harry with him until Malfoy played a prank on Neville. Then Hagrid had Harry and Neville switch, so it was Malfoy and Harry with Fang instead. Which then lines it up with how the movie had it. And after that, they stayed pretty similar. Malfoy, a.k.a. Nazi Von Douchebag II, a.k.a. Bitch-Ass Snitch, and Harry go off with Fang in search of the hurt unicorn, which they find a little more than hurt, they find it dead, uh, with a cloaked figure drinking its blood. Yeah, that's basically how it happened in the book, too. Except before they played musical search parties, Hagrid, Harry, and Hermione ran into a couple of centaurs, Ronan and Bane, and they learned that Mars is bright tonight. Unusually bright. Right? So helpful, ruddy stargazers. (laughs) But then they did the switcheroo and Harry and Draco find the unicorn, and we are back on track. Yep. And in both the movie and the book, Malfoy runs off like, well, like a bitch. Then the centaur Ferenz comes in hot with the two-hoof beat down and saves Harry. Yeah. He is actually the only centaur we see in the film. Yeah, and in both, Ferenz helps Harry understand that it was Voldemort who was after the stone. Though in the book, he actually lets Harry ride on his back, and we see Ronan and Bane again. They are furious with Ferenz for letting a human on his back like he is a common mule. A hashtag common mule. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. In the movie... Harry and Ferenz just stand there talking until Hagrid and the others show up. Then the scene cuts to the trio in the Gryffindor common room where Harry explains what he learned from Ferenz about Snape wanting the stone for Voldemort and then he will come back to kill him. This is basically what happens in the book too, except it's Harry and Hermione meeting back up with Ron in the common room since he wasn't at the detention. Harry also says that it must be written in the stars that Voldemort will kill him. I think this is a brilliant little touch, too, because it means the centaurs were reading in the stars that Voldemort would kill Harry in the Forbidden Forest. That's some crazy foreshadowing right there, since Voldemort does technically kill Harry in the forest. Spoilers. Oh, like they don't already know. (laughs) Touché. But this is also when Hermione reassures Harry that he's safe as long as Dumbledore is around because Dumbledore is the only wizard that you know who fears. She does that in the movie too, although she actually uses Voldemort's name. I know, and that always annoyed me since she doesn't start saying Voldemort's name until much later in the series. I heard a theory that it doesn't make sense that she wouldn't use his name since she grew up with muggles. She wouldn't know the same fear that his name brings. 
I actually have heard that before, too, but I don't think that really matters. She would have read about him in probably several books. True. And I'm willing to bet that if the magical folk are unwilling to say his name, they're probably also unlikely to want to publish his name. So she probably would have learned his name as you-know-who, or he who must not be named, or the Dark Lord, and would have called him one of those because that's what the books say. Could be, because as we know, Hermione does tend to go by the book. I actually think we should make this our Potter pondering. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what other people think. But this is where the movie scene ends. The book goes on for one more little scene. Harry eventually heads up to bed, and when he pulls back the covers, his invisibility cloak is there, with a note saying, just in case. Now this doesn't happen in the movie, but that is because he never actually lost it in the movie. (laughs) Yeah, and once again, the movie made them less stupid. Mm -hmm. They didn't lock Hermione in the bathroom with a troll, and they didn't leave the invisibility cloak on the tower. Yeah. And this brings us to the end of this section of the story. We do have another actor to mention since we did meet Ferenz in the Forbidden Forest. And he was voiced by actor Ray Fearon, who is a Shakespearean actor. And when I first heard that, I thought he would be kind of old. Then you looked him up and saw his picture. Right? And he is hot with two T's. There's two T's in that hot. I did put two T's in there. You did. <laughs> and it's because it's true. Yeah. He also has a great voice, Mm -hmm. though I feel like that's a requirement to be a Shakespearean actor. Definitely. He was great as friends. He had a very ethereal quality to his voice. Yeah, he definitely pulled off stargazing omniscient quite nicely. Right? Pisses me off even more they didn't include him in the later films. Right? And we will talk more about that then. In 20 years. Hopefully less. (laughs) (laughs) In the meantime, our Potter pondering for this week is... What do you think about Hermione using Voldemort's name in the movie when she didn't in the book? If you have any thoughts or ideas on the subject, just head to our Facebook page at JKR Podcast to find the post and let us know what you think. And now we're going to move on to this week's Sorting Hat story, which is from Abby Rorick. She writes, I have always identified as a Slytherin, but hadn't thought I'd ever done the official sorting. I went to log in to figure it out, and it turns out I did get sorted once before, and after resetting my password, it proclaimed that I am a Slytherin. My wand is elder wood with a unicorn hair core, ten and a quarter inches, with unyielding flexibility. My Patronus is a greyhound. I hadn't previously done that, but now I know. I'm not sure how I feel about my Patronus being a dog. But from the moments the books came out, I was into them. I bought each one on the day of their release and read them right away. I did the same with the movies. Now my son is watching the movies with me, but slowly. He's slightly afraid since he's only six and has a huge imagination. I love when people share the movies with their with their kids. I I mean, Ginny has been watching the movies since she was born. Honestly, in the womb. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, pretty much for the most part. (laughs) I would fall asleep with them on, you know, it's kind of a thing I did. But so she doesn't really have the option. To not see Harry Potter. But, you know, it's nice. It'll be nice once she can, act, once she knows what's going, going on. on. Yeah. yeah. Once she understands the plot and she can, you know, talk with me about it. And, and I'm hope- just, I'm just hoping she doesn't hate them. Right? Because <laughs> that would be your luck. It would. It really would. It's that's my worst fear. I don't want to have to disown my child. But, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. You'd have to change your name, too. I know. Oh, we could just go call her Juniper at that point. But you the could. memories will still be there. That'd be so sad. I can't handle it. So, yeah, Jenny, if you're listening to this now in, like, a couple years, when Mommy actually lets you listen to this, you better be liking Harry Potter. Yes, in a couple of years when she's four. Yeah. Mommy's going to let her listen to the explicit podcast that we make. She lives with me. She lives <laughs> with the explicit podcast. Very Believe good me. Point. She lives with the explicit podcast. <laughs> Anyway, let's just keep rolling. Believe me, she's lucky that her legal name isn't an expletive. That's not rolling. Fine. Our trivia question this week is, what chess pieces do the trio play as in McGonagall's giant chess set? The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag checkmate will get a bitch is a witch, motherfucker is a wizard, a Just Keep Rolling, or a Pride sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you're an Apple person, you can do it through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. 
If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. And don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. We also want to welcome Diana Chapman as our newest patron. Thank you so much for helping us out. We are thrilled to have you as part of the Just Keep Rolling family. Yes, thank you, Diana. Keepers, if you are interested in supporting us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 16, Through the Trap Door, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. rolling.